Welcome to the Science of Academic Success. Multiple choice exams are pretty much an essential component of our university experience. But when it comes to preparing for and writing multiple choice exams, are you as effective as you could be? In this video, we'll discuss how to prepare effectively for multiple choice exams, and we'll also take a look at the research that identifies successful techniques to use while you're writing multiple choice exams. Note, I have a separate video that focuses on effective studying. Here, we're focusing on preparing for and writing multiple choice exams. A bit of an overlap between the two topics, but each video definitely covers different information, so I encourage you to also check out my video on studying techniques. In order to prepare effectively, we have to know what we're preparing for. Therefore, we have to clarify what a multiple choice exam is getting us to do. What's happening cognitively as we are answering a multiple choice question? The opening statement or question, which in the testing industry is called the stem of a multiple choice question, can be asking us to label an idea, define a concept, identify a correct solution to a problem, or apply an idea to an example. Then we are presented with multiple response options, and we have to apply what we've learned in order to sort through the incorrect options, these are called the distractors, and identify the correct response option. A well-constructed multiple choice question will present the test taker with plausible alternatives, where the distractors will look as if they are valid possibilities, and they're not just jokes or gibberish. A well-constructed test will be designed to assess differences in the test taker's mastery of the material. Those who have mastered will successfully be able to eliminate the distractors and identify the correct response. If we have really mastered the course material, then we'll be able to play around with those ideas. We'll be able to analyze the concepts, apply them to examples, recognize the concepts when they are stated using different wording, and manipulate and apply these ideas to think through and solve problems. If we haven't mastered the course material, then some of those distractors are going to look plausible. We might recognize the ideas that are stated in the distractors, but we won't be able to articulate why those concepts are not the correct solution to the problem in this particular question. So how do we prepare effectively for this? For a multiple choice test, we should ensure that we are preparing for each of the different forms of multiple choice questions. In our studying, we want to study definitions and facts, examples and applications, analysis and synthesis of ideas, and comparisons and contrasts between ideas. And this brings me to one of the key fundamentals when preparing to write a multiple choice exam, a concept that I refer to as studying in the gaps. Often when we're studying, we focus specific, specifically on learning what a concept is, the meaning of the idea, but we stop there and we don't take a moment to reflect on the limits of each idea. How far does the concept extend and where does it stop? When we're studying, we also want to think about the limits of each concept, studying in a way that allows us to understand the differences, the gaps between different concepts. We want to be doing this because a multiple choice question will present us with multiple plausible response options. And in that moment, as we're sitting there trying to eliminate the distractors and identify the correct response option, what are we doing? We're trying to articulate and identify the differences between these response options. What makes this response option different from the others? Not only do we need to know why one option is the correct response to the question, but we also need to know why the distractors are different, why they are incorrect. This is the gap, the difference between the concepts. If the correct response to a particular question is classical conditioning, then we not only need to know the meaning of classical conditioning, but we also need to know how the next response option, say it's operant conditioning, is different so that we can know why it is an incorrect response. In the text or lecture notes, we'll often see concepts presented right back to back or in comparison with each other. This is because they are in some ways similar. There's something that links them, but they are also different in important ways. So that if the exam has a question about one of those, then it's likely that you would see each of them as a response option. This is why when you're studying, you need to master each concept. And this includes thinking about what makes each one unique from the other. By incorporating this into our studying, what we're really doing is creating the same sort of cognitive processing during studying that we are going to have to do when writing our multiple choice exam. In this way, we are making our practice studying more similar to what's happening during the exam. 
You can take this a step further by generating your own multiple choice questions. Generating your own questions, including generating the response options, is an effective study technique for multiple choice exams because it gets you to think about the course content through the lens of multiple choice questions. And in terms of practice, it is very relevant practice when studying for a multiple choice exam. This sort of cognitive processing is a key element to add to your multiple choice exam preparation. Let's move over to talking about effective techniques to use while writing the test. In order to be a successful test taker, we need information. We need to know what sort of test we're writing. For example, what is the time limit? How many questions are on the exam? These two pieces of information are really important as this information allows us to plan for how much time we have for each question. If the exam is 60 minutes and there are 50 questions, then we have about one minute per question with a 10 minute buffer. So we know that we want to keep an eye on the time and if we're getting hung up on a single question, then we may want to come, um, move along and come back to that question later. You also want to know in advance whether this is the sort of exam where there may be a penalty for getting incorrect answers. Uh, this isn't a common sort of exam, but you could encounter them. For most exams, you earn a point for each question you answer correctly, and you get no points for incorrect responses. But if there is a penalty for incorrect responses, then this penalty takes away from the points you've earned. If the example is one where there's no penalty for incorrect responses, then if you encounter a question where you're unsure of the correct response, you should at least take a guess. Plus, if you can manage to eliminate one or two of the response options, then you can improve your chances of guessing correctly with the remaining options. For this sort of exam, you want to ensure to answer all the questions, even if it's a guess. But if the exam is one where there is a penalty for incorrect responses, then you may want to evaluate your guessing strategy, taking into consideration the amount of penalty for incorrect responses and guessing only when you're somewhat sure of your guess. This sort of information about the exam is typically communicated in class and or in the course syllabus. In addition, these important details of the exam are typically found on the front page of the exam. And this is one of the reasons why it's really crucial to read the information on the cover page of the exam. Okay, so we're sitting in the examination room and we're handed the exam. How do we start? Read the cover page. It should tell you the time limit and the number of questions. Plan your time. Know your time per question and build in a bit of buffer for the end. Skim the exam. Make sure you have all the pages and all the questions and take a quick look at the questions. Get started. As you complete each question, mark your response on the exam and at the same time you should also mark your response on the multiple choice bubble sheet. Some people will hold off marking the answers of the bubble sheet until the end. This is a bad strategy. It increases the likelihood of making errors. Therefore, as you complete each question, you should also mark that answer on your bubble sheet. If you run into a question that you're having difficulty answering, move along. Make some sort of mark next to the question so that you'll know to come back later, but move along and get the rest of the exam done. As you're answering questions, feel free to make marks on the exam. If there's an important word or some key information provided in the stem of the question, underline it or circle it. This will help you focus in on the key elements of the question. Focusing on the question is one of the most important things you can do. And it turns out that one of the most common mistakes that people make on exams is not really reading the stem of the question. For whatever reason, anxiety, stress, carelessness, time pressure, people sometimes don't read the question. And failing to fully and carefully read the stem of the question is going to reduce your likelihood of success. Connected to this idea, a study by McLean and another study by Guar and colleagues each has demonstrated that we should be covering up the response options while we're focusing on the stem of the question. Looking at the response options before or while we are trying to read the stem of the question is associated with lower performance, whereas higher performing students covered up the response options, read the question, and thought about the possible answer. The higher performing students, after fully reading the stem of the question and thinking about the possible answer, then uncovered the responses and fully read all of the possible responses. And this is another common error made by low performing students. When they're reading the response option, the mistake is to stop reading the response options as soon as we encounter one that looks acceptable. Higher performing students read all of the response options. 
When we stop at the first response option that looks okay, we miss out on additional information from the remaining responses. Perhaps the additional information from the later options opens our eyes to a flaw in the initial option and causes us to change our mind because we now perceive the error in the initial choice. All of this is consistent with research by Bethel Fox and colleagues and also by Vigno and colleagues, each of which was testing Richard Snow's conceptualization of two different problem-solving strategies. Higher ability subjects were more likely to use what's called a constructive matching strategy. First reading the problem, then building an idealized answer before checking the response options. In contrast, lower ability subjects were more likely to use what's called a response elimination strategy, where they would switch back and forth between the stem and the response options, trying to compare features in order to eliminate some of the options by default. And if this wasn't enough to convince you, a 2015 study by Gontier and Thomason demonstrated that using the constructive matching strategy, that's the one where we read the question and think before looking at the answers, impacts our ability to successfully use our working memory when solving problems and was related to improved performance. And a 2010 study by Mitchum and Kelly demonstrated that using this constructive matching strategy was related to an improved ability to accurately judge our performance. What's the takeaway point? Cover up the responses. Carefully read the question. Reflect on the answer. Uncover the responses. Carefully read all the response options. Let's uh, wrap this up by discussing how to finish the test. If we've been managing our time correctly, then we should have left a bit of time buffer at the end. We've already filled in the answers on the bubble sheet because we were doing that as we went along. We've completed almost all of the questions and maybe only have a few of the challenging ones to come back to. Check how much time you have for these remaining questions and get them done. And with your remaining time, we can address some of the common ways that people lose marks on exams. Check the bubble sheet for errors. Did you fill in your name and student number? Are the bubbles for your name and student number filled in correctly? Are the bubbles for all of the response options filled in correctly? Did you leave any blanks or miss any answers? If you have also been marking your answers on the exam booklet, then you can go back and check for transcription errors where you had meant to choose response A, but you had accidentally filled in the bubble for B. But what about changing answers? Should we be reviewing our answers and potentially changing our responses? A study by Higgum and Girard demonstrated that reviewing responses does have an overall positive impact on our performance. It allows us to find instances where we have filled in an incorrect response or misread a question, meaning that it helped with error detection. But reviewing answers does not necessarily help improve performance when we don't know the material, meaning that if we don't know the concept, going back and reviewing the question isn't going to help us discover the right answer. But at the very least, it can help us find any errors for the questions where we did know the correct answer. This just reinforces the importance of effective studying. Check out my web channel for a discussion of how to apply the science of memory and learning to make your studying more effective, as well as videos covering other areas of academic success in university. Thanks for watching.